Jeff Jenkins is our speaker for this session, and we are glad that he is here. His wife, Laura, is here as well, and we're happy for that. Jeff uh, holds degrees from uh, both Faulkner and Fried Hardeman Universities, has done postgraduate work at Southern Christian University, now uh, Amridge University. And Jeff, along with uh, two of his good friends, Tommy Haynes and Russ Dyer, uh, published a couple of uh, excellent books. I think they've actually got more than two now. Uh, the two that, uh, that I recall and have benefited from, Redeeming the Times and uh, Reaching for Passion, two excellent books that, uh, that they helped put together. Jeff is currently working with the Lord's Church in Louisville, Texas, has been uh, preaching the gospel since 1973. And Jeff and Laura have two children. Jeff, we're glad that you're here. We look forward to your lesson on the golden text of the Bible, Brother Jeff Jenkins. Thank you very much, Brother Eddie. It is always a pleasure to come to the Fort Worth Lectures. Uh, since uh, my dear friend Tommy Haynes first brought me here about uh, about uh, 14 years ago now, I guess it was. Uh, this has been one of my favorite weeks throughout the year. And I've come to love and appreciate the Brown Trail Church. Uh, since moving to Texas about five years ago, we have come to love and appreciate the elders of this good church for their leadership, uh, for the opportunities that they afford young men and the opportunities that they afford our brotherhood. And we have come to love and appreciate, of course, Brother Maxie Bourne and uh, now, Brother Eddie Parrish, and all of those who are associated with this church and this school, and all of us are very grateful, and I also am thankful for this opportunity because uh, each year it's a great opportunity to renew old acquaintances and see people that you only get to see about once a year, and that is always a, a delightful experience. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There's probably not a person in this room this evening that would fail to be able to quote that text. It's been called the golden text of the Bible. It's been called the gospel in miniature. It is the theme of the Holy Scriptures. For God so loved the world. In March of 1957, Brother Gus Nichols was asked to come and hold a gospel meeting in La Mesa, Texas, or La Mesa, Texas, depending on where you're from. Brother Nichols preached a series of messages on that occasion, and although it was not the plan at that time to put those messages in print, they have since been put into print. And one of those sermons that he preached during that meeting was entitled, The Great Love of God. Brother Nichols began by reading the text, John 3, verses 14 through 21. And he said, this is to be a textual sermon, a sort of analytical study of this beautiful verse of Scripture. We want to study this text word by word and thought by thought. And then Brother Nichols began in his own eminent way, to explain that this great text is made up of superlatives. And he gave a listing of the superlatives that are found in this text. And you've probably heard this sermon presented in that way before, or you've read this sermon presented in that way. And then Brother Nichols began to describe not only the superlatives as he took time with each one of them. Brother Nichols also, on that occasion, began to try to describe the breadth in the depth, in the height, in the dimensions of the love of God. If you haven't read this sermon, I would encourage you to do so. I thought for a moment about just getting up and reading it. There are certain books in preachers' libraries, as you know, that are special to them. Like most preachers, I have uh, a number of books. There are some of my books that I'll be glad to loan you. You can take them home and read them and study them and keep them as long as you want. There are a few other of my books that 
I will let you come into my office and sit there and read them and look at them, but you can't take them out of the office. There are a handful of my books that if, if I allow you to look at them, you will not be able to touch them. <laughs> they are too precious. I hope that all of you will get a copy of this and somehow read this great sermon on John 3.16. I grew up in Alabama listening to Brother Gus Nichols preach quite often. The Nichols family means a great deal to the cause of Christ, and it was only really after moving out west that I became acquainted with Brother Hardiman and Sister Virginia Nichols, and I don't know of any two people that I love more dearly than, than those two wonderful people. But I want to take the study this morning, this evening, from John 3.16, and I want to observe, make four observations based upon this text. I know that many of you have preached sermons and taught classes on John 3.16. I know that many of you have studied John 3.16 uh, extensively. And so probably there will not be much new that you'll hear today, but I just want to remind you of the love of God. Observation number one, as we look at this text, we observe in the first place that our world is in desperate need of a Savior. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. God recognized that the world was in need of a Savior. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, John tells us, the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. In Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32, the Apostle Paul gives to us a description, a graphic picture of a world in sin. If you read those verses, it looks like it could be the front page of any major metropolitan newspaper in any major metropolitan city. It is a graphic picture of a world in sin. As you know, Paul was giving a description of the Gentile world. In Romans 1, 18 through 32, he talks about people who did not have the benefit of having the written law of God. If you turn the page to Romans chapter 2, you'll begin in verse 1 and you'll see that Paul said, But you, O man of God, you are without excuse. It's my conviction that Paul turned his attention primarily from a Gentile world to a Jewish world. And he was saying the Gentile world in chapter 1 did not have the benefit of the written law, but you in chapter 2, you Jews had the benefit. And later on in the chapter, he will explain this in detail. And so you have in Romans chapter 1, the Gentile world is in sin. In Romans chapter 2, you have the Jewish world in sin. You turn the page to Romans chapter 3 and you'll see in verses 9 and 10, there is none righteous, no, not one. And if you look down at Romans 3 verse 23, Paul concludes by saying, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Gentile world is in sin, the Jewish world is in sin, and it's almost as if Paul is saying, if I left anybody out, I want you to know the whole world is in sin. The whole world lies in the lap of the evil one. Ladies and gentlemen, in the church, we need to understand and we need to call to remembrance on a daily basis that we live in a sin-filled world. The world is in sin. In Ephesians 2 verse 12, Paul tells us that the world that is within sin is without hope and that they are without God in this world. A few years ago, we were preaching up in uh, Canada, and we were invited to take a, a tour, and they took us out to Niagara Falls, and we had a guide, and he was showing us the Niagara Falls, and he was explaining about the Niagara River. And he said, if you are coming down the river in a boat, as you are approaching the falls, a few hundred yards from the falls, there is a large sign that hangs there, written in large letters, and it says simply these words, do you have an anchor? It is designed for nonchalant boaters. He says another hundred yards down before you get to the falls, there is another sign that hangs across the river in very large letters, and it simply says, do you know how to use it? I want to suggest to you that our world is headed for the falls. And the question is, do you have an anchor, and do you know how to use it? The Bible contains in the New Testament some 260 chapters. By the way, it has been brought to my attention recently, and you may have already known this, uh, you may be way ahead of us, but uh, we've learned recently that there are 260 chapters in the New Testament, and did you know there are 260 weekdays in a year? If you read one chapter a day, Monday through Friday, five days a week, you can skip Saturday 
and don't skip Sunday, but if you read five days a week, one chapter a day, you would read through the entire New Testament in a year. We've challenged, where I preach at Louisville, all of our members to do that. We know there's some who will read through the entire Bible, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. It happens every year. But we also know there are some that don't read the Bible as often as they should. And so we've challenged our folks to read one chapter a day, five days a week, and they'll read through the New Testament in a year. But in those 260 chapters, someone has come up with the conclusion that there are 242 verses in those chapters dealing with the judgment of God. We're headed for a fall. Do we have an anchor and do we know how to use it? The most vivid picture, the most vivid passage is recorded in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 where the writer says, It is appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment. These are warnings concerning God's judgment. There is an urgency about the fact that we live in a world in sin. But as we'll see in a moment, Romans chapter 3 does not end. The book of Romans does not end with Romans chapter 3 verse 23. And every one of us ought to thank God for that on a daily basis. There's more to it than that. But the point is clear. We live in a world that is a world in sin and a world that is in desperate need of a Savior. Observation number one, the world is in desperate need of a Savior. Observation number two, based upon this text, this word of love is for everyone. For God so loved the world. It is a word of love for everyone in the world. The word cosmos, from which we get that, the Greek word, from which we get the English word world, we also get English words like cosmetology and cosmetics and, and all of those words. That word occurs 18 times in the book of John. 18 times John uses the word world in each of those times. And there is another word that is translated world. And the word world occurs many more times throughout the book of John. But this word means the inhabitants of the globe. He's not talking about the globe itself. He's not talking about the sphere. He's talking about the people who live on the globe. God loves the world. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And in Romans 5 verse 8, Paul will tell us that God commended or He demonstrated His love for us that even while we were sinners, Christ died for us. In 2 Peter 3, 9, Peter says, The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some men count slowness, but He's long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God's word of love is for everyone. In Titus 2, verses 10 and 11, we read these words, The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. God wants everybody to be saved. If you study the book of Titus, there are three chapters in the book of Titus. In each chapter of the book of Titus, the name of God occurs three times after the introduction. It occurs once in chapter 1, once in chapter 2, and once in chapter 3 after the introduction. Each time that Paul uses the name of God in this great book, he gives a description of God. And each time the description simply says, God our Savior. God our Savior. God our Savior. God wants everybody to be saved. And did you know also that the name of Jesus Christ is mentioned three times after the introduction, once in chapter 1, once in chapter 2, and once in chapter 3. And each of those three times you read a description of Jesus and the text says, Jesus Christ our Savior. Jesus Christ the Savior of all men. Jesus Christ our Savior. And Paul will tell us that God is so saving by His nature that in some way He is the Savior of all men. Jesus Christ is the Savior of all men. Well, in what way? Well, one thing that we know is that He is the Savior of all men in a temporal sense. God allows the sun to shine on the just and the unjust. He allows the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. God loves the whole world. And He wants the whole world to be saved. That's why we read in passages like Micah chapter 7, verse 18, that He is called the pardoning God. That's why we read in Isaiah 55 verse 7 that He will abundantly pardon. You see, this word of love is for the whole world. And I want to ask you today, brothers and sisters, do you believe that? Do you understand that? Do you want the love of God to be shown to the whole world? Do you want everybody to know that God wants everybody to be saved? 
God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And you see that throughout the course of the Bible. You see it in the book of Genesis. You see it as you turn to the book of Ruth. You see it as you turn to the book of Jonah. Jonah is a marvelous example of God's love. God said to Jonah, I want you to go down there to that wicked city of Syria, of Nineveh, the capital of the nation of Syria, and I want you to tell them that if they don't repent, that they're going to perish. But God loved them so much that He sent Jonah down there to preach to those people. And as you know, Jonah got on a boat and he went the opposite direction. And it was during that time that God arranged the special three-day Mediterranean cruise for Jonah. Three days in the belly of a whale, and the whale couldn't even stomach Jonah for more than three days, and he spat him out on dry ground. And then Jonah went down there, and I believe, Brother Eddie, that Jonah got out his sermon files, and he pulled out his favorite sermons on judgment against Gentiles. And he went down there and he preached the the message of God to those people. He preached the love of God. And you know what happened, brothers and sisters? Everybody repented from the king all the way down. And there's even a statement there in Jonah chapter 3 that blows my mind every time I look at it. I don't understand it. I hope you'll explain it to me. But it seems to indicate that even the cattle of the field repented. Now there's some powerful preaching right there. But he was preaching about the love of God. And you remember what happened? Jonah became upset and he sought and he went over there and sat down in the field and God raised the gourd vine, whatever that is, and let it grow up over him. And God came to Jonah in Jonah chapter 4 verses 1 and 2 and he said, Jonah, are you angry? And Jonah says, well, God, as a matter of fact, I am. I knew that you were a loving God. I knew that you relented from doing harm. I thought I knew about your graciousness, but I'm not sure I understood all of that. And the question is, do we have the heart of Jonah or do we have the heart of God? And the heart of God says, I want the whole world to be saved. And if we are going to be men and women of God who proclaim the message of God, whether it's from the pulpit or in a Bible class or from our automobile or in a restaurant or at school or wherever it is, we must have a heart for lost people. We must be concerned about people that we come in contact with on a daily basis. I sat down this morning before I came over here with a friend of mine. He said, I want to visit with you. He wanted to talk about his future. And he said, before we talk, can we say a prayer? And I said, sure, why don't you lead the prayer? And in the course of that prayer, he said, Father, we pray that today you will place someone in our path that we can teach your word. There's the heart of love for the lost. What if every child of God, what if every person who were in this room today began each day by praying, Father, put somebody in our path today that needs to know about your love. The word of love is for everyone. Observation number three. When we observe this text, we notice that the way of salvation is Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. His only begotten son. In Acts 4 verse 12, Peter said, There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby they must be saved. In John 10 verse 10, Jesus said, I've come to seek and save the lost. Or in, in Luke tells us that in John 10 verse 10 we read, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. If you were to open your Bible with me to John chapter 1, you would read in verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And John is going to go on to explain the fact that there is nothing that has been created that was created without the Word. The Word was instrumental in the creation. The Word was there in the creation. The Word was a part of the creation. And everything that was made was made by Him. And then if you'll go down to John 1 verse 14, you know the text that says, And the Word came in the flesh and dwelt among men. And we beheld the glory of the only begotten of God, full of grace and truth. 
Now you've quoted that passage and you've studied that passage, but I want to ask you to look at it one more time. When Jesus came into this world, what did we see? We were to behold the glory of God. Now he goes on to tell us that he was full of grace and truth. The word grace, the Greek word kateris, it simply means God's unmerited favor. Same idea of Titus chapter 2. Same idea of Romans chapter 3 and Romans chapter 5. Paul said, it, or, or John tells us that it was full of grace and truth. Truth aletheia, God's holy word. John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth, for thy word is truth. But I want you to notice the word glory. We beheld the glory of the only begotten of God. In the Old Testament, when the Bible talks about the glory of God, the Bible uses the Hebrew word kavod. Kavod. Kavod simply meant it had to do with the presence of God. And as you know, in the Old Testament, people did not have the opportunity to really behold the glory of God. But whenever the glory of God was present, what did they do? They would draw back away from that because of their great respect and their great love for God and because of their feeling that they could not get close to the glory of God, they would stay away. And so when Moses is up on the mountain and he receives the tablets of stones, remember God walks by, but what does Moses see? He doesn't see the face of God. He sees the hinder parts. He is seeing, I believe, the glory of God. And the Bible says that when Moses came down from the mountain, the people could not look upon him because he had been in the very presence of God. It was the glory of God. It was the glory of God that we, we learn about when we see Isaiah saying, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips, I'm not worthy to be in the presence of God. We see the glory of God when Moses is in the wilderness and that bush is burning and that bush speaks to Moses. We see the glory of God. We see the glory of God in the Holy of Holies, the most holy place, and we see the people saying, we can't go back there because that's where the glory of God dwells. In the Old Testament, they were not really allowed to get a glimpse of the glory of God, but whenever the glory of God was present, they shied away from that. Now turn again to John 1 verse 14. The Word came in the flesh and dwelt among men, and we beheld the glory of God. Do you see, ladies and gentlemen, that Jesus came into this world so that we can know the glory of God? He came into this world so that we could see the glory of God. But what happened? In the Old Testament, men would not look upon the glory of God because of fear and because of respect and because of love and admiration. In the New Testament, the glory of God comes to the earth and dwells among men. And what do men do? Oh, that's just the carpenter's son. We don't want to have anything to do with him. He came to his own and his own received him not. And so men now have the opportunity to see the glory of God, to behold the glory of God, but they fail to do so. And if you'll turn with me to John chapter 17, John chapter 17, in this prayer that Jesus prayed, that is sometimes referred to as the high priestly prayer, Jesus lifts up his eyes to heaven. Eyes there come from a Greek, Greek word that we get our English word ophthalmologist from, ophthalmos. He lifts up his ophthalmos to heaven. And he says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son that the Son might glorify thee. I want you to get a sense of what Jesus is saying. You remember all throughout the accounts of the gospel, you have Jesus saying over and over again, the t my time is not yet. The hour has not come. The hour is not, I'm not ready. But now Jesus, in the shadow of the cross, before he goes into Gethsemane, he bows his knee before the Father, and he says, Father, my hour has now come, and I want you to glorify me so that I can glorify you. Men had an opportunity to see the glory of God, but they failed to see the glory of God. And now Jesus says, Father, show them the glory. And you know how they're going to see the glory? In only one way. Isaiah 53. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. 
The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes we are all healed. Two times in Isaiah 53, Isaiah says, He poured out his soul unto death. It was only on the cross that men would see the glory of God. Jesus said, Father, glorify me so that you can be glorified. They could not recognize the glory of God. They would not get close to the glory of God in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, when Jesus comes, they would not see the glory of God. And so Jesus has to hang upon a tree for men to see his glory. And it is that glory that we proclaim to the world. It is that glory that we preach and teach It is that glory that we sing about. It is that glory that we pray about. It is the glory of God that we share with the lost and dying world. And the only way, the only way for the world to know about the glory of God is if we tell them Jesus is the only way. Now if you'll go back to Romans chapter 3, Paul says in verse 23, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He says in the very next few verses, beginning in verse 24, thanks be to God, He writes for us that we are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And the righteousness of God is given to us. If you go back to Romans chapter 1, you're very familiar with Romans 1 verse 16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, the good news, the euangelion. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is God's dunamis, God's power to save men. All to all who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile, to those at the end of Romans chapter 1, to those in chapter 2, to the whole world. But look at Romans 1 verse 17. In this gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed and He says, It is writ as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Your Bible may say, the righteous shall live by faith. Literally, I believe the text says, By faith the righteous will live. By faith the righteous will live. Now you know probably that this is a direct quote from Habakkuk chapter 2. If you don't know the story of Habakkuk, you need to go back and read it. Habakkuk chapter 1, Habakkuk is writing to God about all of the problems in the world, about all of the sin, about all of the chaos. And Habakkuk basically says to God, God look at the mess the world is in, why aren't you doing anything about it? Why don't you fix this world? And you look at Habakkuk chapter 1, and guess what? Habakkuk chapter 1 is almost exactly like Romans chapter 1. A world in sin. And people are crying out, God, why don't you do anything about it? And guess what, ladies and gentlemen? Habakkuk chapter 1 and Romans chapter 1 and our world today are all the same. A world in sin. And read Habakkuk chapter 2 and God says, by the way, Habakkuk, I am doing something about it. You go on and do your work, I'll do mine. What you need to know is, most of all, what you need to know, Habakkuk, is that it is by faith that the righteous will live. And Paul uses that passage to talk about the gospel. And he's about to talk to the Gentile world, and he's about to talk to the Jewish world in sin. And Paul says, what you need to know is that it is by faith that the righteous will live. And so you go to Romans 3 and you read verses 24 and 25 and he says we're justified freely by his grace through faith in Christ Jesus. And as Brother Mike Winkler pointed out yesterday, it is faith that is a working faith. Nobody's going to argue that we're not saved by faith. But where is that faith that saves you? What is the point of that faith that saves you? What is the saving experience of that faith? And Paul will go on later on in chapter 6 to explain that. It's interesting to me that He mentions in Romans 1.17, by faith the righteous will live. If you look at Romans chapter 1 through chapter 5 verse 2, 25 times Paul uses the word faith. 25 times. And then in those passages he will use the word live two times. By faith the righteous will live. And so he starts with faith and then in chapter 5 and you pick that up, Paul turns from the prominent conversation about faith to saying the Christian life is about living the Christian life. And he's going to talk about how you should live. And a part of this faith, he will say in chapter 6, will lead you to be buried with Christ in baptism, to, to be crucified, to crucify the self, 
to be buried and to be raised to walk a new life. A new life. By faith, the righteous will live. It starts with faith and it causes us to live. And the point that Paul is making in the book of Romans is that without Jesus, you cannot be saved. And a part of that faith, a requirement of that faith, is that you're willing to obey Jesus. And so, he will say in Romans chapter 3, that Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. He is our mercy seat. He is God's satisfaction. He is the appeasement offering. By faith, the righteous man will live. And so we observe the world is in desperate need of a Savior. The word of love is for everyone. The way to salvation is through Jesus. And then the fourth observation I would like to make this afternoon is the work of grace is the most difficult part of our Christian life. The work of grace that we do is perhaps the most difficult part of life. For God so loved the world that He gave. He gave. Think of all of the ways that God could have said to the world, I love you. Think of all of the ways that God could have said to each of us, I love you. But when God wanted to say, I love you, He gave. It's just a guess, but my guess is that the most difficult part of God's scheme of redemption, the most difficult part of God's plan, the most difficult part of it all was giving His only Son. 1 John 4, 19 says, We love because He first loved us. And it was that love that motivated God to give. Sometimes we talk about the fact that grace is not cheap. I want to tell you today that grace is not easy. It is difficult. And God was willing to do the difficult work of grace so that we could be saved. 2 Corinthians 5.21 is the passage that explains the great substitution, the great exchange. God made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. God gave. He made Him. Who, knew, who is that? Well, as one writer says, the field becomes very narrow at this point. As a matter of fact, there was only one. The sinless, perfect Lamb of God. The writer of Hebrews says He was holy and harmless and separate from sinners. The one who said of Himself... You have said the truth. The one of whom Peter said, For thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, to whom shall we go? The one of whom Pilate said, I can find no fault in this man. For God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. What does that mean? I've heard some bizarre statements about that. I heard a fellow one time say that, that, that God while Jesus was hanging on the cross, that he had to become a sinner. No, a thousand times no. Jesus was as sinless and perfect and holy and harmless when he was hanging on the cross as he had ever been in eternity before and as he ever would be in eternity after. Don't let anybody ever convince you that Jesus ever committed a single solitary sin. Don't you see that if Jesus would have sinned, if he would have committed one sin, he would have had to die and go to hell for his own sins. He made him who knew no sin. That simply means he bore our sin. He became our substitute. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That simply means that God gave us his righteousness. Jesus, the sinless one, did not deserve to die, but he was crucified so that all of us who are sinful could experience the righteousness of God the great exchange. I paid a debt I could not pay. I owed a debt I could not pay. He paid a debt he did not owe. The work of grace is the most difficult part. And as we close, I want to suggest to you it is the most difficult part for all of us. It's easy to stencil under your eye in a football game, 
John 3, 16. It's easy to hold up a sign like Roland Stewart. Some of you remember back in the 70s, the Rainbow Man wore that funky-looking hair-colored rainbow hair. In a, on every sporting event, you could see him holding up that sign prominently. John 3, 16. It's easy, brothers and sisters, for us to say, this is a church that loves everybody. But the difficult work of grace will cause us to talk to the stranger who comes through the door, who doesn't look like us, who doesn't smell like us, who isn't one of us. It's easy to say this church loves everybody, but the difficult work of grace will take, take the time to spend with that individual and say, let me tell you about the love of God. It's easy to talk about loving one another, but the difficult work of grace loves those cantankerous, negative, critical brethren who all they want to ever do is complain Listen, husbands, it's easy to talk about loving my wife in a Sunday school class, but the difficult work of grace will show her on a daily basis how much she means to me. It is easy, church, for us to gather together on a weekly basis and to pray for all of the lost people in our community, but the difficult work of grace will get out in our community and try to find those people who do not know about the love of God. It is easy Preachers to sit in our office and work up a sermon to preach to people who will come and listen. But the difficult work of grace will get out into their lives and get to know them and find out what's going on and let them know how much we care about them and be with them when they hurt and pray with them when they're weeping. It's easy, elders, to get into a conference room and pray for the members of the congregation who have fallen away, but the difficult work of grace will go and knock on their door and say, we haven't seen you in a few weeks or months or years. And let us just say up front, we're sorry that we haven't come sooner. It's easy, elders, to sit in a conference room and hire a youth minister to raise and train your young people but the difficult work of grace will go sit in those classes and make sure that the pure, unadulterated Word of God is being taught and to get into those lives of those young people and let them know that they mean something to you. It's easy, elders, to sit in a conference room and say to the preacher, we're going to give you a 2 or 3% raise this year, but the difficult work of grace will go and Grab him and say, let's go to lunch. I want to know what's going on in your life. How's your family doing? Listen to me preaching, brethren. It's easy to sit in the office and study or write or even pray. But the difficult work of grace will cause us sometimes to get out into the lives of the people to whom we're teaching. It's easy to write articles about other preachers and about other churches and explain all of the problems that are part of our brotherhood, but the difficult work of grace will genuinely be concerned about the lack of unity in the body and do our part in bringing about healing. It is easy for us to tell the church we love you, but the difficult work of grace will cause us to be involved in the life of the church. It's easy to talk about the grace of God, but the work of grace will cause us to be dispensers of God's grace. We love, John said, because He first loved us. And so, the point is that God's amazing love must flow through us. We must be conduits of the grace of God. We must be dispensers of the grace of God. It is easy for all of us who are here this afternoon to quote John 3.16. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm not asking you right now if you can quote this scripture. I'm asking you, do you live it in your life? I'm asking you if it has become a part of who you are and what you are. I'm asking you if you have implemented this into your family preachers, 
You go out and preach to people and talk to people about being good and you come to church and you treat your family the way that you should. How do you treat them when you get home? It doesn't matter whether we can quote the passage or not if we're not living it. And so are we living it? Are we putting it in our life? Has it become a part of who we are? And is it growing in our lives and our hearts? And are we spreading it to a lost world? If we in the church who claim to be leaders, preachers and elders and deacons and Bible class teachers, if we learn what John 3.16 means, you want to talk about radical change? If all of those of us who are part of the church can understand what John 3.16 means, we wouldn't have people coming to services complaining about, well, I don't like this, or I don't like that, or I don't like this type of song, or I don't like that type of song, or I think the announcements went too, too long, or the preacher preached too long, or the prayers went too long, or I, I, don't, I don't like what people are wearing. And you see, if we really, really come to understand what John 3.16 means, it'll change the world. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. May God help us to have that kind of love for this world.